All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday night church, and I'm glad you're here. So I get to preach tonight, so I'm pretty excited about it. I just want to take a minute and say thanks to Pastor Jacob. He said he's going to watch tonight, so uh, he's probably watching. It's kind of like the principal's watching, right? So, uh, no, I am grateful for our pastor. How many of you guys appreciate our pastors? Amen. Are they just, I love their heart. I love their vision. I just love them. Pretty good people. So I'm excited. I'm just really glad that um, I get to, whenever you serve under uh, an anointed man of God, then guess what? The, the, the anointing flows and so I'm just walking in that anointing. I'm excited about tonight. So, well, tonight we're going to open the word into the Old Testament. Who's, who's, who's excited about the Old Testament? Hey, it's, it's good. It, it applies to us today. You're going to see that, that the Old Testament absolutely applies to today. And uh, so we're going to jump right in as soon as I can get situated here. <clears throat> and... Uh, so let's read this scripture, 2 Chronicles, chapter 6, and verses 8 through 9. Brought my glasses tonight because I'm reading this word that's, I don't know, for some reason I got to hold the Bible further and further away to read that. Does anybody else relate to that? Must be the age I'm getting. I've never experienced that before, so it's kind of weird that I got to hold it further away to see it. So that's probably a sign that I got to get some readers. So, Second Chronicles, chapter six, verses eight and nine. Let's just read it. But the Lord said to my father David. So this is Solomon speaking. But the Lord said to my father David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did that did well in that it was in your heart. This is actually. Solomon quoting God, God saying this. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. One more time, let's read it one more time. But the Lord said to my father David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well, and then that was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, David, but your son Solomon who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. I'm going to talk tonight, your son will build it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we get to open your word, which is timeless. It lasts forever. So many things are temporal, but this is eternal, God. So we thank you for your word that never ever returns void it always accomplishes a work and so God let this not be an exception tonight let your word have its working power tonight in each of us God you promised it you said that your word will never return void so we remind you of that God that your word will go forth change lives change hearts God point people back to you See the lost saved. See your church built in these last days, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this is Solomon quoting from his father. It was David's message to Solomon from God Almighty. And if you remember, David didn't get to build the temple because he had too much bloodshed. He's only the second king that Israel's ever known. You know, think about that. This is the second generation of kings getting passed on to the third generation. This is David speaking to his son saying, you're going to build it, son. And, and there's so many correlations that, uh, that we, as the body of Christ today, can glean from this passage. I almost titled this a little bit longer, I, I, the last day's church dash your son will build it. 
The last days church. Who believes that we're in the last days church today, right now? This is the last days church. And what I want to put out there today, what I want to charge and challenge the church today is, if you and I don't get to build it, then at least let our sons and daughters build it. At least prepare the next generation to build this last day's church. Just like Solomon prepared his, or David prepared his son Solomon to build the, that temple in that day. He completed that temple, Solomon did, in seven years. Seven years of planned, coordinated effort to build a suitable place for God. Now, even the idea of building a place to house God is kind of crazy, isn't it? And Solomon says that, and so does David. You know, who can build something for the creator of the whole universe? But yet God saw the desire on David's heart to build something for God to dwell in. And he said, that's good. That's good, David, that you have that desire. It is good for us to want to build the last day church. It is good for us to have the desire like David had to build the temple up for a place for God to dwell. And likewise, it is good for us, you and I, to believe and wait and, and, and work towards building this last day's church. David for today is this last day's church that we're now living in. The first thing that I see in this, when we read 1 Chronicles 22, verse 7, this is 1 Chronicles. So you've got to go back in time to get to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles is really Solomon. 1 Chronicles, is a lot of it is David passing it on to, to Solomon. So in, in 1 Chronicles 22, let's just read that, verse 7. David had good intentions, but he inquired of the Lord how to get it done. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build the house to the name of the Lord my God. Go on. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, You have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build this house because you've shed much blood. David had good intentions. It is a good thing to want to build a temple for God to live in. And how does that relate today? It is a good thing for us to build up the temple of the Holy Spirit now, to get it ready. And in this last day's church, God wants a spotless church. Have you thought about that? He wants a bride that is perfect. Now in my mind, that's how in the world does the church, you and I know all the faults of the church, as Pastor Jacob talked about last Sunday, He's seen the ups and we've seen the downs. We've seen the valleys and and the mountains and we've seen it all. How in the world can God in these last days get a perfect church? But that's what he's coming back for. The Bible says that he's coming back for a perfect temple. And in the Old Testament, God wanted, if it was going to get built, he wanted it to be right. He wanted it to be perfect. And so he, he... acknowledged David, said, that's a good intention you have there, David. But you've you've had too much bloodshed. Your son, Solomon, whose name means peace, he's going to build it. So I think it's just interesting. I think it's really important to notice that David had good intentions, but what did he do? He inquired of the Lord on how to get it done. He asked God, God, I want to build you a temple I want to build you a magnificent dwelling place. I, have, I live in this beautiful palace. And where do you live? You don't have, I want to build something for you. And God says, good intentions, David. I see your heart. David was a man after God's own heart, wasn't he? And God, all his life, God recognized that. He encouraged that. He, he, he uh, encouraged his son. He didn't... You know, it, this wasn't a mean thing for, for God to do. Say, no, David, you cannot build this temple. No, he says, I understand where you're at, David, but I want your son to build it because his name is peace. And peace is how I'm going to get this built. 
Number two is based on the word of the Lord. David prepared. He set him up to succeed. So based on this word that David received, is there so much in this for us in the church and the body of Christ today? We get the plan from God, and then we go, okay, how can I best set up this next generation to make sure that David, that Solomon, my son, builds this temple? So you can see David, this king, in his palace, he's old, he desires to build, he's, he can do anything at this point, he's killed giants, he's, he's conquered the land, Israel is in the best place it's ever been, it went from under Saul's reign, it was deteriorating, falling apart, the Ark of the Covenant was stolen from the children of Israel, Saul dies in battle, Jonathan dies the same day in battle, David comes on the scene and it restores Israel back to a right place to God, didn't he? He led Israel and Israel was blessed, I mean highly favored. Every battle that David would go into, he'd, what would he do? He'd inquire of the Lord, Lord, shall we go and pursue this tro troop? And God says, yes, and you shall recover all. And David would go and, and, and battle and win. So David, based on the word from the Lord that said, no, David, you won't build it, but your son will. David then says, then I'm going to set up my son to succeed. How does that relate today? We have children in children's ministry, students downstairs right now in, in student ministries and youth ministries that need and desire and want. They don't, may not show it all the time, all right? But they need the advice from this older generation. They need you and I to be fathers and mothers to them. Some of them don't have fathers and mothers. Some of them have fathers and mothers, but they're absent and they're not there to pour into the kids. So, so David says, I'm going to pour into this next generation. And if I can't build it, there's, there's no way he can fail because I'm going to set him up. And David begins setting him up. In, Second Chron or in First Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 6, we read, Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. If we go back up a little bit, this is all in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. And he says in verse 3, David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors, and for the joints, and bronze in abundance beyond measure, and cedar trees in abundance. And he, and he lined up the, the workers... The foreigners in the land, he said, you guys are foreigners in this land. You're going you're gonna to be my labor force. And, and you're going to help me, help Solomon build this. So physically, so, so David helped his son in the physical realm, right? Physically, he said, I'm going to gather the materials. I'm going to gather the resources, the stones, the stonemasons. I'm going to get all that in place for you. I'm going to gather the labor force, the iron, the bronze, the cedar trees, the labor. We're going to have them start working on that ahead of time. He has, he has relationships that David has built all along. What, like the king of Hiram, which was down south, was where Lebanon's cedars were. Did you guys ever go to the Lebanon where cedar trees were in Israel? Back there, these were the best cedars of the land. And Hiram was a king that David saw, saved. The guy was going to be defeated by his enemies around him, and David came in and saved him. So that guy owed him a favor. So David calls him up. Well, probably didn't call him up, but sent a messenger over there and said, listen, I need you to provide cedar trees. We're going to build a house. Can you do that? And all Hiram said was, well, if you can feed my labor force, then I'll get you the cedar. So they cut, he got a labor force together, cut them sent him up the Jordan River, floated him up to where he needed to be. And, and, and that's what David did to prepare Solomon. He not only prepared him physically with physical materials and a labor force, but he 
charge David with the task. Look at 1 Chronicles 22 and 6. I just read it a minute ago. Then he called for his son Solomon and he charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. He charged him to build a house. The, my Bible has a little number by charged and, and you can look at another meaning of that name, uh, that word. And it's commanded. David commanded his son Solomon to build the temple. You know, rather than being quiet and silent Christians, sometimes we got to speak up to this next generation. And the best way to speak up to the next generation is to have a very clear vision of what God wants for the church in these last days. Amen? What does God want for the church in the last days? He wants a perfect, spotless church. Pastor was right on this past Sunday when he said, hey, we've neglected. We've got to get this, this building right. If we want a spotless church, it's not just the, the spiritual, it's the natural. All areas has to be right. And that's what David wanted this temple built right. And so he charged him. He commanded his son, you and I, can take authority when we are clear with the vision. You and I both know, all of us know, that, the, that Jesus Christ is coming again, don't we? Not everybody knows that. Christians don't really understand that. The, the young generation doesn't quite know. Why are we going to church? Because my parents did, my grandparents did. We got to share with the next generation. Hey, you know what? Jesus is coming back. We got to be ready we got to be spotless right on. we got to build this temple perfectly for Him. we got to build the church perfectly for Him. we got to get the trash out. So David took the task to command his son Solomon to call him into his office and to charge him. The next generation needs a calling and they need a charge. You and I are the ones that give that to them. How? I mean, they can hear it in Sunday school or they can hear it from Pastor Desmond. And, but what if they hear it from you? What if you, while you're sitting down having dinner with them before this class and you get a chance to sit with some of the kids that come on our transportation ministry and you say, hey, you know what? Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? What in the world would kids say if you said that? What do you mean he's coming back? This next generation has to understand why we're doing all this work, right? We, otherwise, we're doing, we're, we're being religious. You know what kids don't like? Religion. We got to love one another. We got we to do this because Jesus Christ is coming back for a perfect church, Amen. So the next generation needs that calling. They need that charge. And we cannot be silent anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking to me. I'm preaching to me. I hope you hear this. Uh, this, is, this is a word to all of us. This is a word to the Bethalto Church of God Wednesday night crowd because a lot of you have been through ups and downs like I have in this walk in Christianity that would, for a new Christian, it might eject them out, right? But you and I have weathered those storms. And so you and I, there's a reason that we went through the challenges and the trials of the ups and downs of what not only Bethalto Church of God, but all of this Christian walk deals out to us from time to time. Amen? So the next generation doesn't understand that. And if you can come alongside and say, hey, I know you're going through a tough time, but listen, it's worth it. It's worth it. So David, I can just see him in his throne, bringing Solomon up on his knee. Hey man, son, I don't get to build this temple, but you get to. You're going to do it. I believe in you, Solomon. I believe you can take it and you will succeed. You will prosper. He charged him. David then blessed his son. There's something about a blessing of a father that comes to a son. For some reason, former generations have been silent when it comes to blessing their sons. 
but a son craves and desires the blessing of his father. And even those that are not our natural born sons, you could see this. These kids on the transportation ministry, these two boys I think of, Daryl and Darrell, I can never tell which one's which. They're twins. And I just kind of got to go and go, hey, Daryl. He goes, it's Darrell. I'm like, oh. And I hug them and I bring them in and I say, yeah, I love you guys. I bless you guys. There's something about a blessing of a father to a son. David blessed his son. Look at verse 11 in chapter 22. Now my son, this is David speaking to his son while he's, he's about to die and he's blessing his son. He says, now my son Solomon, may the Lord be with you and may he prosper you. This reminds me of that song that came out of just before the pandemic hit. From Carrie Job, you've heard it. We've, we've been singing it. May he prosper you and bless you. Amen. This is, this is probably where that came from. Now, my son, may the Lord be with you and may he prosper you and you will build the house of the Lord your God as he has said to you. He not only blessed his son, but he made it a word that was not just to David, but he made the word to his son. In other words, Solomon could easily go, well, my, God told my dad to tell me to build the house. Right here, David says, no, I want you to know that this is from God straight to you, Solomon. Because in the past, we've seen where the earlier patriarchs, if you remember, the God of Abraham and the God of Jacob and Isaac, and, 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 and you remember how Jacob would say, well, the God of my father. He wouldn't say, my God. David learned from that mistake and said, no, Solomon, this is your God. Your God is charging you. He's saying, you do it. Likewise, you and I. Don't ride on my coattails, son. I want you to get a relationship with your God. Hear what he's saying and carry out the plans. I'm here to help. I'm here to coach you. I'm here to give you some advice. I'm here to pray with you. But I want you to hear it from God. That's what David did. Look at that in verse 11. And he, for what he has said to you. Look at verse 12. Only may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding and give you charge concerning Israel that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Not only did David bless him by saying you're going to prosper, he made the word from God also to David, but David taught his son not to, does this sound familiar? Hey, son Solomon, don't lean upon your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You know where that is? Proverbs. Solomon remembered the words of his father, David, and wrote them down later, right? Not only that, what was the first thing that Solomon asked for when he first became king? If we go back a little bit, did, did Solomon ask for riches? Did he ask for power? No, what did he ask for? Wisdom, didn't he? God, I'm, I'm young, I'm untrained, I don't understand. David taught him that. David taught his son to trust in the Father God. He taught him from the very beginning. He taught him, don't try to do this in your own understanding, Solomon. Inquire of the Lord. Before I ever went into battle, I, I can see him telling his sons about these different battles. You know, Solomon, what I did was, all the guys were ready to go into battle. They had their swords ready. Everybody's ready to go. And I said, hold on a minute. I need to go back into the cave. And I need to get on my knees. And I need to ask God if we're going to win this battle or not. And sometimes God would say, don't go that way. I want you to go about around a different way. And he taught that to his son Solomon. Likewise, you and I are here to teach the children that come behind us. Don't try to do this in your own strength, guys. You'll mess up. It has to be done by the Spirit of God. 
He taught him not to lean on his own, own understanding. He taught him to ask God for wisdom. And, and Solomon asked God for wisdom, didn't he? Somehow, sometimes we wonder if kids are getting what we're trying to lay down. But Solomon got it, didn't he? He picked it up and he wrote it down. But he got it from his father. You and I, likewise, we got to pass this on. We cannot be silent. I, can, I, I believe David was just a talker. I believe he just told stories. I believe he taught his sons well. You, but you know why he taught his son Solomon so well? Because he had a very clear picture of what he wanted his son to do. And that was build the temple. It was very clear. This is exactly, here's the plans. He had architects draw it all out. Solomon, all he had to do was pick up the plans and go when David died. Did you know that? So literally, that's what David did. Likewise, we, you and I know the plan. You and I know that Jesus is coming back for a perfect church. And the only way that we're going to get the church ready through the power of the Holy Spirit is to speak to the next generation, to love the next generation, to let them build this temple, to let them succeed, to teach them to trust in the Lord with all their heart and lean not on their own understanding. In all their ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Another thing that that David taught his son Solomon as he's trying to prepare him to do this mighty deed of building the temple is he gave him charge concerning Israel. Verse 12, Only may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding and give you charge concerning Israel that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. What does that mean? Give you charge concerning Israel? Command. It's another word for charges that God may give you command over this land and this people, Israel. Not in, a, not in the way the world does it where they lord it over. Remember when Jesus was telling his, teaching his disciples, hey, this is not the way to lead. When you see others lording it over and, and forcing people to do things, that's not the way you lead. How do you lead? You lead by serving. And let me show you how. And, and, and Jesus knelt down on his knees and he washes the disciples' feet, right? And he served. He became a servant. So David taught Solomon, may God give you charge concerning Israel. In other words, favor with the people. May the people see the vision, Solomon, and support you. When the people see the vision, they don't perish. For lack of vision, we perish, don't we? But when they can see the vision that was passed on from the Father to the Son, when they can see the plans, there's just something about a set of drawings. Jimmy's a carpenter. I'm a carpenter, too, in my previous life. Not previous life, but earlier before I did... Uh, uh, we're not doing incarnation in here. In my <laughs> earlier days, I was a carpenter. I'm, I still have a tool belt. I put it on once in a while. My dad's an architect, so I totally understand. Have you ever tried to build something without a set of drawings? It's not good. It's not good at all. But if you have a set of drawings, you reference the drawings. What, what, what do we do now? Now what are we going to do? Well, the drawings lay it out clearly. And that's similar with the law. Verse 12 also says that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. What was David known for? If you think about Psalm 119, Lord, I keep your law written in my heart that I might not sin against you. The law, he kept, the, the law back then was five books. The first five books of the Old Testament that were written by Moses. That's what it was back then. It was just the Pentateuch. The first five books. That's and, and David had that there. And he said, listen, Solomon, keep this law around you. Read it. Read the stories about how the Red Sea was split open and our people, our relatives passed through on dry land. Read it so you can be encouraged. If you don't read this, Solomon, you might get overtaken by confusion, doubt. You will. So he said, keep the law. 
I want you to keep the charge over Israel. In other words, I want, I want you, I'm blessing you. So you can see David just putting his hand on Solomon saying, I bless you to prosper. I bless you to, to succeed. I bless you that the people would follow you because you have a good vision. And I bless you. to keep the law of the Lord your God. Keep this law. How does this relate today? If we don't read this word, we're getting sifted like wheat. Sifted. If we don't study this word, if we don't get into this word on a daily basis, it's even more so. You know, I, I'm so glad that my youth pastor, when I was growing up, we used to kind of joke about it. Hey, you know, what was the point of John Reynolds' sermon today? Well, he said to pray and read your Bible every day. Pray and read your... If, that, if that's the only thing that I learned from all that, that's a really, really, really good lesson. You hear me? If there's anything we can learn, we got to keep this law. we got to stay in this law. The law sounds hard, you know, not fun to read, the law books, right? But this Bible, this Word of God is alive and active and, and sharper than any two-edged edged sword. And it gives you power. And it gives you uh, the reason to keep going. It gives you faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We have to have... Faith isn't just... We're all given a measure of faith, but you know how faith grows? By hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. So reading this Word. They read the Word out loud. That's how they learned it back then. We could use, we could do that today. You know, in the, on this Bible app, I'm, I'm doing the chronological Bible. Who's reading through the Bible in, in a year? Anybody? It's a really good idea. Okay? You can do it on your phone where it, it does it for you. I'm doing it chronologically. I've done it that way for the last few years. And what that means is the Bible, as it's written, it's not exactly in order of how it all happened. This app puts it in chronological order so you see what happened and it's, it's just a nice way to do it. I'm in, guess what, Second Chronicles. So I just read that a couple days ago and that's why I'm preaching this tonight, right? The, the Word of God, you can actually on this app you can press a button and it reads it out loud to you faith cometh by hearing hearing by the word of God so I not only am we got to do that in these last days you know you, you hear me we got to hear this word we got to get into this word so may God give you charge concerning Israel and may you never lose track of the law keep it close keep history close Read it, memorize it. You know, there's a reason why the enemy is trying to destroy history. You understand that? If you don't have a history, you have nothing to live for. If you don't recognize where you came from, or if that history has been changed, which is what the world is trying to do now, to make history not what it was, to rewrite history and make it so that you think that you're oppressed in some way. If we don't know this history, we will learn whatever history they want to feed us. You got to know this word. We got to know it. This is history, but we got to know our own uh, United States history too. Keep that close. Because guess what? The United States was a, a promised land of sorts. Like the, the, the pilgrims were oppressed in England and they flee, they were fleeing from England to get to this promised land. It's very, very similar. If you read the history, you'll recognize that oh, they were, they were oppressed, not able to freely worship, so they left for a promised land and God pointed them to here. Then you will prosper. He says that. Keep the law. And then in verse 13, then you will prosper, Solomon, if you, are take care, if you take care to fulfill the statutes and the judgments which the Lord charged Moses concerning Israel. And then he gives him this last charge. Be strong and be of good courage. Do not fear and be not dismayed. Where have we heard that before? That's what Moses told his son. Wasn't really his son by birth, was it? But Joshua was like a son to Moses. 
much like what you and I are to this next generation. Not natural sons and daughters. Moses found somebody that was seeking after God and he poured his life into him. And he said, listen, Joshua, I don't get to go over to the promised land, but you do. Do you see the pattern? There's a pattern in the Bible that shows just like Moses was to Joshua and David was to Solomon is like what we are to this next generation. And like, Dave, and like Jesus was to the disciples. Hey, I'm not going to be here. i got to go so that the power of the Holy Spirit can... Is, it's necessary for me to leave the earth so that the power of the Holy Spirit can come and anoint you guys. And you guys are going to do greater works than I ever did. And the disciples are looking at him like, what? How is that possible? And they did, didn't they? Jesus was adding to the kingdom of God as he was walking the earth. The disciples in the early church was multiplying. Multiplication of people coming to the kingdom. And it's been growing ever since. And here we are today, continuing that. Be strong, be of good courage. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. That'd be, good, some, that'd be some good advice for this next generation, wouldn't it? In the middle of everything that they're going through, that this world throws at kids if we could say hey listen be strong be courageous I got you you need me call me I'm praying for you I'm with you in this David also in verse 14 this is so amazing he set him up not only physically not only emotionally not only you know with good words and and not only with a blessing, laying his hands on him and blessing him, but he set him up financially. Let's look at verse 14. Indeed, Solomon, I have taken much trouble to prepare for the house of the Lord. 100,000 talents of gold, 1 million talents of silver, and bronze and iron beyond measure, for it is so abundant. I have prepared timber and stone also, and you may add to them. What's David saying? I've set aside funds for you to get this done. You know, I always wondered, in today's, you know, back in the old days when you had to prepare for, when you prepared for a message, you had to go into Vine's Dictionary and Strong's Concordance. Now you just Google, you know, you just look it up on the internet. So I said, what is one talent of gold? Anybody got an idea? How much is a talent? I thought maybe it's an ounce. You know how much an ounce of gold is right now? About $1,800. You got one ounce of gold, it's $1,800. It's been as high as $2,000, was the highest ever was back in 2020, a few months ago. So the, the price of gold has gone down since the election for some reason, I'm not sure why. But anyway, so gold, the pr gold $2,000 it's worth, give or take, for an ounce. You know how much one talent is? A talent of gold, the measure is the, the weight of a man during that time. What? The weight of a man. And, you know, back in the old days, they weren't quite as big as we are today. So I'd be two talents right here. One talent is about 70 pounds to 110 pounds, somewhere in between there. 70 pounds to 110 pounds. So if you take $2,000 for an ounce, and you take that times 16 ounces, that's $32,000 for a pound of gold. And David supplied 100,000 talents of gold for his son. He set it aside. So I did the calculation. I had to turn my phone sideways so all the zeros could fit on my calculator. Otherwise, it gave me an error message. You know how much 100,000 talents of gold is in today's dollars? Which would be the same. So imagine, this, is, this would be like David going, okay, if he was living today, it'd be this much money. It'd be $352 billion that David set aside for Solomon to build the temple. That's just the gold. I didn't even calculate the silver or the timber or the stones. Just the gold to finance the project, David set it aside and said, here's, 
here's Solomon. I got this treasure chest over here. It comes out to about 352 billion. You, got, you think you can handle, you know, building a temple on that? I don't know why, but in America today, for some reason, we've, we've lost, and I'm, not, I'm just speaking generally, I'm not, but, you know, the, the living next to the Joneses and I got to have this and that. We're not even thinking about the next generation like they were back then. We're thinking, how can I get this really nice house and two kids and all these things, this, why don't we set up the next generation? Why don't we just like not care? This is all going to pass away anyway. Why don't we just invest into the next generation? I want my son, my son-in-law, my daughter, I want them to succeed way beyond me. How about you? That's, that's the right mentality. That is the right way to think about this. Not for us. It's for that next gen- I want them to be. So David set up Solomon it was virtually impossible for him to fail because David set him up. He said, here's $352 billion in gold and here's a bunch of silver and here's a bunch of timber already cut. It's already stacked over here, Solomon. Here's the plans. I just want you, here. just put it together. Can you do that? How does that relate today? Can we set up this next generation to not fail? And take this church to the next, to be ready for Jesus Christ's return by saying, you know, if we don't teach our kids how to, how to live financially correct, if we don't teach our kids to tithe on every penny that comes in, birthday money, I mean everything. Teach your kids from a young age. And, and you and I, yeah, our kids are on, grown. But the next ch- children, when you see them, say, hey, listen, you got some money there. You know what God says to do with that so you can be really, really blessed? If you get $10, guess how much you got to put in the offering plate? And have them learn that. Oh, it's a dollar. Help them put a dollar in the offering plate. Help them learn. Here's how you're blessed. That's how David got blessed. David had $352 billion in gold because he tithed. You know that? That's why. He followed the law of God. And God blessed him. You know why Solomon was the wealthiest man that ever lived? Had a lot to do with his father. The reason why Solomon was so blessed and had so much wisdom is because his father, David, poured into him and said, I'm I'm going to make sure that you succeed, Solomon. I'm going to pour into you. He set him up so he couldn't even fail. Hopefully we can cut that from the tape. Probably not. So David did all that, and then we come to Solomon's prayer. Because Solomon was explaining all this in our text right now. Solomon is explaining to the people why he built the temple. Because right now, in this context where we're at now, the temple is done. He spent the seven years. He spent the money. He spent, he's, he's taken the timbers. He's taken the masons. They've put it all together. And they're at the dedication service of the temple that he's just built. And now Solomon conveys all this message and says, this is why we built the temple. Is there something that we can learn from this? This is why we're doing all this work, guys. This is why we're teaching Sunday school. This is why we're pouring into you because it's worth it. So Solomon prays in 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 14. So let's go ahead to 2 Chronicles 6. And 14. And he said, This is Solomon praying. And I'm just going to read the whole prayer. And I want you to think about this prayer. In fact, let's just pray this prayer. Would it be all right if we just prayed this together? Oh, Lord God of Israel, 
There's no God in heaven or on earth like you who keep your covenant and your mercy with your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. This is Solomon praying. You've kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You've both spoken it with your mouth and you've fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying you shall not fail to have a man sit on me on the throne of Israel, only in your, if your sons take heed to their way that they may walk in the law as you've walked before me. God, Lord God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David. But will God indeed dwell with men on earth? Behold, heaven and earth and the heavens cannot even contain you. How much less this temple which I've built. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and my supplication, O Lord God. Listen to the cry of my heart and the prayer which your servant is praying before you. That your eyes, God, that your eyes may be open toward this temple day and night. Can you see us praying that for our church today? God, would you watch over our church? Would you keep your eyes open to our church as we're trying to do this? We may not do it perfectly, but would you keep your eyes open to it? Toward the place where you said that you would put your name. See how he's reminding God of what he promised? It's okay to do that. Some might look at this prayer and go, wow, you're trying to command God. No, he's reminding God of the promises he said. That you would put your name, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place. And may you hear, not only would you see God us growing this church, but would you hear the supplications of your servant, me, and your people, Israel, and when they pray towards this place, would you hear from heaven, your dwelling place? And when you hear, God, would you forgive when we mess up? And if anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, God, would you, would you hear from heaven and act and judge your servants and bring retribution on the wicked by bringing... That, that on his own head and justify the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness? God, would you do that? Let's pause right there. Can he do that in this world that we're living in right now where it seems that wickedness is running rampant? Where the political craziness is just, where the, the fraud and all this craziness, can, can God, God, can you hear our prayer when we're going through that wickedness? Can you see how it relates to the church today? It does. Then hear from heaven, God, and judge your servants. Or if your people, Israel, are defeated before an enemy because they sinned against you, would you re and then they return and they confess your name and they pray and they make supplication before you in this temple. God, then he, would you hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people, Israel, and bring them back to the land which you gave them and their fathers? He's covering everything, isn't he? He's saying if we, if we go in battle and we get defeated, if we sin, if we, if we mess up, if we don't do building the church perfectly, God, would you still hear from us? Would you still hear our cry that we want to do it right? Then hear from heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel. Bring them back to the land which you gave them and their fathers. When the heavens are shut up, God, when there's no rain and there's drought and our main source of income is by planting the field. And the heavens are shut up because of our sin against you. And when they pray, see how he switches it? He says, when the next generation prays, God, not only my prayer, but would you hear the prayers of those that go after me? Would you hear the prayers of Bethalto Church of God when they mess up and they don't get it exactly right, God? When they pray towards this place and confess your name and they turn from their sin because you afflict them, God, then hear from heaven, forgive them. Forgive the sin, God. Your people, Israel, that they may teach, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land. Would you hear us when we cry? Next slide. When there's famine in the land, God, when there's pestilence, when there's blight or mildew, when the stock market crashes, when the housing market 
bubble bursts and when everything goes, when a pandemic hits, would you, God, would you hear from heaven? It's because of our sin. We know that. Because he's speaking to the church. We sometimes think, oh, well, those guys are sinning. The church, we got we to gotta get right. He's speaking to the bride of Christ that has to be spotless and perfect. So guess what? We don't have it all together yet. So God, when famine is in the land, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people, Israel, when each one knows his own burden, his own grief, and spreads out his hands to this temple, when they raise their hand and pray, then God, would you hear from heaven your dwelling place? Would you forgive? Would you give everyone according to his ways, whose heart you know? For you alone know the hearts and the sons of men. Look at the wisdom of Solomon. You alone, God, you know what our thoughts are that they may fear you to walk in your ways as long as they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. He keeps reminding them this land was given to us. Moreover, concerning a foreigner, he not only prays for Israel, but he prays for all the foreigners that are in the land of Israel. Much like the melting pot of the United States of America. We're not praying for just this remnant God. We're not praying for just our church. We're praying for all, all people. Any foreigner. There is no racism in the church of God. There is none. You see that? Foreigner. Uh, concerning a foreigner who is not of the people of Israel, but they've come from a car, far country because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray in this temple, God, would you also hear from heaven for, on their behalf? your dwelling place and do according to all which the foreigner calls you to and that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel that they may know that this temple which I built is called by your name again the church is not a building that just has a name Bethalto Church of God it is for Jesus Christ that name has to be lifted up when your people go out into battle against their enemies, wherever you send them, and then when you pray towards the city which they've chosen, the temple I've built, he just goes on and on. And when they go into captivity, keep going. When, would you hear from heaven, God, when we go into battle? Would you hear from heaven and maintain their cause? Keep going. It's a long prayer. When they sin against you and there's no one who does not sin, God, and if you become angry with them would you, and, and deliver them into the enemy's hand and they get into captivity... When they get into bondage, when they get into slavery, when they get into addiction, God, would you hear their prayer when they're caught up in this bondage that the world throws at them? Yet when they come to themselves, doesn't it remind you of the prodigal son? He finally came to himself when he was in the pig pot pen. When they come to themselves, God, in the land where they were carried captive, and then they repent, and they make prayer to you in the land, and we have sinned, we've done wrong, we say that, you know, we've committed wickedness when we repent. And when they return to you with all their heart, with all their soul. You gave to their fathers the city which you've chosen. Keep going. Then would you hear from heaven and make supplication. God, so what Solomon prayed was a prayer a powerful, powerful prayer. But he learned it from his father, didn't he? He learned how to pray from his father. How much more, remember? And, and the disciples were like, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Solomon, I could just see, looking up to his father David, boy, if I'm going to read this, if I'm going to build this temple, God, I'm going to need to learn how to pray. Da David, father, would you teach me how to pray? And David taught him. Now, God, I pray, let your eyes be open and let your ears be attentive to the prayer made in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, to the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with salvation. Let your saints rejoice in goodness. And he ends it by saying, and O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of my father, your servant, David. Remember how you were so merciful to David. And then what do you think happened? Chapter 7, verse 1. 
and fire fell from heaven and consumed a sacrifice. Very similar to when Elijah prayed and at the end of his prayer, fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Very similar to when Abraham and Moses, very similar to the first early church up in that upper room, they prayed, they fasted, they stayed together, they ate together, they, they were together in one accord in unity, and the Holy Spirit fell, and there were mighty flames of fire upon each of their heads. Fire appeared, much like the Welsh revival when they prayed. The fire of God fell, not in physical form, in a supernatural way that cleaned out sin and that created the greatest revival that went from overseas to to our land when they prayed, when the church finished praying. When Solomon finished praying, the fire fell. When the early church finished praying, the fire fell. When the church of today finishes praying, which it'll never be done, the fire will fall. Let's stand together. When the church prays, Azusa Street revival happens. Read it. Read the history of how Azusa happened. It was prayer. It was was out of a time of great tribulation, great trial. 1906, you know what happened in California in 1906? Earthquake. One of the greatest earthquakes of all time. Many, many people killed. Revival never comes when we expect it. It comes when there's a desperate cry, but God, we got to have revival. Azusa Street happened out of a desperate people praying to God, saying, God, you got to do something. We just had an earthquake, people are dying everywhere. This is the, it must be the end days. God, Please, we repent of our sin. We come to you. Would you hear our cry? Would you hear from heaven and heal our land? The church of God, the organization that we're in, was birthed out of the Azusa Street Revival, which happened after the earthquake in 1906. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was so powerful it went from the West Coast to the East Coast and everywhere in between. And revival started. And then a few years later, when the church finished praying, Brownsville happened. You know, that, that, that revival, that great revival that happened down south in Florida didn't just happen. It was, if you hear John Kilpatrick or any of the leaders of that time, they were travailing in prayer, in prayer meetings over and over. John was miserable. If you hear him tell tell his testimony, God, if you don't move, I don't know what I'm going to do. He was literally this close to leaving the ministry. I want a move of God so great, God. And now here we are in 2021 after a great pandemic which tried to close the church doors. You know what I think could happen? I think the church could get to a place like Azusa Street that says, God, we're desperate for you. We repent of our sins. We're not trying to pin the sin on somebody else. I repent of my sin of not sharing this gospel like I should. Of not raising up this next generation like I should. God, would you hear from heaven and heal our land? Send revival, God. Revivals never occurred when people expected them. They came out of desperate times after droughts and famines and yield from desperate prayers after earthquakes, after pandemics, after political unrest, after violence in the streets. Then revival happened. Because the church 
had a vision for the next generation. And they built the church, but they let the next generation build it as well. If you and I can't build this temple the way it should be, if we can't prepare the tip, temple for the second com- coming of Christ, then prepare the next generation to build it. That's what we're called to do, guys. Because in our action of preparing the next generation, we get prepared too, don't we? Amen? Your son will build it. Your daughter will build it. People that aren't even, they're just children running around in this place or out in the street. These these are the ones that will build this temple. God will build his church, but he uses men to do it. Us and our sons and daughters. That's the other thing. You know, hey, let's just let God do it. No, God always uses man. Bishop Witter said that in the camp meeting. He uses a man or a woman to get his work done. Always. Paul, Deborah, all these names that are all throughout the scriptures. He uses these individuals. The next day after Solomon experiences the fire of God consuming the sacrifice. It was 22,000 cattle, by the way. That's a, I didn't do the math on that. It's a lot of money to sacrifice. 100,000 sheep consumed in an instant by the fire of God. Today we bring a sacrifice of praise into the temple and ask God to consume it. God, consume our praise. Consume my worship. It's all you, God. We've got to bring a sacrifice We don't have to do the blood of bulls and goats anymore. We bring a sacrifice of praise. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. So we bring a sacrifice of praise. The next morning after Solomon experiences this, chapter 7, verse 12, in 2 Chronicles, then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, This is the second time that the Lord has appeared to Solomon. The first time he says, what do you want, Solomon? I'll give you anything. And Solomon asked for wisdom. This is now the second time he's showed up. God appears to Solomon in the night and says to him, I've heard your prayer. And I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Solomon, when I shut up the heavens and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence along, among my people, or if a pandemic hits your nation, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their, heal their land. Can we pray that right now? If my people, God, we remind you of the scripture, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and I'll heal their God spoke that to Solomon in the stillness of night. He could have spoke it to all the the nation of Israel, but instead he speaks it to one man, to Solomon. And now it's the scripture that we all know, that we've all prayed. God, my people. So we pray that tonight, God. We thank you that we are this last day's church that we're getting ready to make spotless. We can't do it alone, God. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. And so, God, when we do, would you hear from heaven when we pray? When we repent, would you pour out your spirit again? Would you consume our worship with fire, God? Would you pour out your spirit in these last days? Not on me, but on my son and on my daughter. But on me too, yes. 
but on my son and on my daughter, God. Help me prepare this next generation. Use me, Father. Help me have the clarity of vision to see what you're doing in these last days. Help me get on board with what you're doing in these last days, God. It's all for your glory. These altars are open. We don't have worship practice for another 30 minutes. What if the church got on its knees, humbled themselves? You can can make an altar right there wherever you're at. You can make an altar up here if you want. But what if we just spent a, a few moments letting the Word of God transform us and help us to pray this prayer? That's our charge. That's our challenge. Let's pray.